Great. Uh, Laz, great to have you here. Thank you. Appreciate really, uh, here. really wonderful Thank to hear everybody. the perspective. And uh, we're following a great conversation with, with Burke and Mike. Have to start with Vandy football, obviously. 2-0. Oh. I mean, this is not very often. nothing. They ran out of that. fireworks this weekend in the stadium. Doesn't happen very often. Mark is a Vanderbilt alum, and uh, my wife's family are, are big Vanderbilt folks. You don't usually see a, an upset to start the season. So is that your, is that your primary rooting interest? Sure. I mean, that's my alma mater, of course. Across uh, all the college sports? Uh, yeah. Vanderbilt, and then I root for ratings. Got it. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I'm very partial to, to ratings and root with uh, our NBC Universal wallet over my heart on many things. Ratings is a great segue. Uh, let's talk about the Olympics. You know, we were backstage with Mark, and everyone who, who came up said, congrats, congrats, because, of course, NBC is, is coming off of really a, a mega Olympics in Paris. There's so much to drill down on, but just big picture. Um, what was that like for you? I mean, I want to ask about, about Peacock and about Gold Zone, the new Red Zone style show, but uh, big picture. I, I think big picture, we looked at these games as a, uh, a we needed to help re-energize the movement here in the States after three games in Asia, after going through COVID, games with no fans, uh, in, in the seats and just a basic lack of energy, uh, both domestically here and then on, on, at the site, we looked at the opportunity for Paris to re reinvigorate the movement here in the States. And a couple of things that we did. One, we went, took, took a, uh, a unique approach, different, I guess, unique in that we've never done it this way. We had done the games the same way for a long time. Uh, we took a different approach. Uh, our team, led by Molly Solomon, our executive producer, said, let's go live all day and then repackage it with a new energy and, no, and do our storytelling in prime time. Our sales team went to work to be able to work with the marketing community and say, OK, that's, that all works together. And so that was a unique approach. And what we learned there was our prime time ratings were a little bit higher, like in the 10% higher than we thought they'd be but our afternoon live ratings were through the roof. And it really captured people's uh, attention and became part of the cultural dialogue. So I think that was point one. Leading into all that, we took a different marketing approach around the athletes, around a little bit of fun, using Paris as a character. Uh, and our marketing team did a brilliant job of letting people know what was coming in the athletes. Third, we put a lot of energy into the trials. And we had two straight weeks of trials coverage in prime time, uh, really two and a half weeks. And that familiarized people with Team USA, with the swimming, with the gymnastics, with some of the other uh, sports as they were coming, as the, the big teams were coming together. And I think those things, and then coupled with our execution during the games around innovation and Peacock, I think led to uh, sort of a cultural moment and a re, imagining and re-energizing of the games. And, you know, it's been 30 days since, you know, the end of the games. They, were, they ended on August 11th. And it does not get old when people say congratulations. It's, uh, <laughs> it's flattering for me and it's flattering for our entire team who really put their heart and soul into it. And we're really excited about Milan and now LA. Oh, yeah, we should definitely talk about LA. Uh, let's drill down with Peacock, though. You know, I appreciated there was a, a comment you made, I think either right at the start of the Olympics or we were halfway, and you said, look, for, for the last time, we weren't really ready. You know, Peacock wasn't where it needed to be. And during Paris, it was certainly there. Now, there are intangibles that can help and hurt. I mean, being in Paris, I think, was a huge part. You described Paris as a, a character. Um, but being able to just watch so much more of it through Peacock, uh, maybe we can break a little news here, but you guys had actually seen a, a slight drop in subs right before the Olympics to 33 million. We're all waiting on that new number, but I have to imagine that uh, we've seen a lot of new subs. But how do you keep the momentum going there with, with Peacock? So um, we'll, we'll take a half a step back. In Tokyo, we, were, we claimed we were going to be the streaming home of the Olympics, and we weren't ready. We didn't deliver the content to the platform and deliver to the fans what we had said we were going to do. In Beijing, we did a much better job. There's a, you know, a difference between the winter and summer games in terms of public perception and attention. Uh, and then we committed to being ready for Paris. And we were ready in terms of that we streamed everything live. We were ready in that we had innovations like Gold Zone, like Multiview, like AI Al Michaels. AI Al Michaels. AI Al. 
Um, and so we were ready, and it delivered. It worked you know, relatively flawlessly. You know, we didn't have any complaints about the streaming around buffering or any of that. Largely, largely worked. And then we started to promote, you know, how do we keep the momentum going? Uh, yes, we added a lot of subs. Um, not giving you a number. <laughs> Those will come out at the end of October in our earnings call. Uh, but we, we added a lot of subs. Uh, some churn, obviously, uh, along the way. Uh, but we added more subs than we thought. Churns about where we thought it was, so we'll end up with more than we planned. Uh, and then we roll right now. Uh, we launched a few original shows right out of right out of the games, most notably Mr. Throwback, Steph Curry's uh, parody show about his life and his, his grade school friend, and it's quite funny. If anyone hasn't seen it, you should take a look. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and now we roll into football season and launch Fight Night out of the opening of the NFL season, which is a, a heist uh, series with uh, Samuel L. Jackson and Kevin Hart and Terrence Howard and Don Cheadle. Uh, and it's a, it's a really fun heist movie around about the night that Jerry Quarry and Muhammad Ali fought in Atlanta when Ali first came back from his suspension. And sort of the, the racial tensions that were part of it, but also the caper that took place. And uh, so that's a really fun thing. So the momentum is about putting all these eyeballs we've been able to acquire and giving them something else they want to watch. You know, we have a huge library of content, whether it's comedies or dramas, you know, whether it's the Office, or uh, that '70s show, or uh, all the Dick Wolf programming. We have all of our Pay One films that come from Universal, plus a large film library that we're, we have, and then our original, both scripted and unscripted. You got a lot to wrap your arms around. Uh, one more Olympics one. How big is LA 2028 going to be? I know you have Milan first, but coming back to the States, it just feels like all the momentum there after Paris, that uh, things are kind of aligning for that to just be enormous. We feel we think it will be very big for us, for the Olympic movement, for the country, for the city of LA. I mean, one of the things, and it's nice people give us all the platitudes around, around Paris, really what helped us deliver was Team USA, the American athletes. I mean, they won a lot of medals. They were entertaining. They were passionate. They, they cared about what they were doing. They were proud to be representing their country. And just all of that excitement that they brought helped mm -hmm. us document the proceedings and got the fans excited. I think being on home soil will, will amplify that even more. If you go back over time, the host country's team typically gets a decent bump in medals just based on pure emotion. France had a wonderful games. Go back to London, they had a big games. Japan had a big games even though there were no fans there. Uh, so that history we think will repeat itself, always has. And I think it will be great for the Olympic movement here in the States. Uh, let's talk about NFL. It's football season. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Very exciting. When we mention Peacock, and I don't want to be focusing too much on Peacock here. I mean, there's also the broadcast network. But uh, yeah, you had the Brazil like game. 25 million people yeah. on the TV set every Sunday <laughs> night. Um, but, you know, I, I, I always am kind of probably inordinately focused on the streaming aspect because we're living through this interesting transition where, especially a property like NFL, every time these rights are up, every couple of years, you see a few more games on streaming. I mean, Netflix is gonna have holiday games this year. Yep. You guys just had your NFL regular season game exclusive to Peacock this season. That was the Brazil game. I saw the numbers there. It was the second most viewed live thing on Peacock ever. Of course, second to the wild card the game wild card that you guys game. had. Yep. So and was it the, was like the yeah. fourth or fifth top streamed NFL game ever. I mean, it's, it's it compared to what Amazon's been doing favorably to many of their games, and they do some that are bigger, and it was, uh, but it was a good, a good run, and, and a good, great, great matchup, exciting game, came down to the end, and it was, uh, you know, we've had a lot of success with, with that game. We also have a lot of success um, with NBC, but also simulcasting those games to a differentiated audience. You know, the, the linear viewers are still, you know, over 90% of the viewers. Uh, if you take linear plus TV everywhere, you know, that's still, TV everywhere is digital. Is it streaming? Is it not? You could argue it is, uh, but that's still the, the pay TV ecosystem. So we're still over, well over nine or over 90% with streaming. Peacock is growing and streaming numbers are growing, 
but we think that's bringing in a, a little bit of younger and a differentiated audience, and there's not that much overlap, and we think that's mm. really good for our products, it's good for our partners, and we think it's uh, the wave of the future. All of the numbers uh, just show no signs of slowing when it comes to the NFL. It's, you know, the ratings every time, it's always the most streamed or second most streamed, and the team valuations, I mean, as you look into your crystal ball for the next five to 10 years, and of course these rights are, are locked down for a while now, and, and we'll talk about NBA, but we're, we're, we've now got a, a little bit of breathing room where the, the major leagues have their rights locked down, and then we'll, we'll come to those re-up moments again. But what do you see happening in terms of you know, linear versus streaming and, and parceling out those games to streamers? I think over, well, as you said, we're, we're all in place for a period of time here. Uh, over time, I think it's in the league and the industry's best interest to keep the broadcasters healthy uh, because of the broad reach. And you know, we're doing 25 million, you know, these first couple games, and we'll average over 20 million viewers per game, and Fox will average with their four o'clock window somewhere, somewhere thereabout, and so will CBS. You know, on streaming, we're not, no one's really getting to that number. So the reach numbers and what leagues have always desired, and I think the NFL has been the strongest at it, is staying on broadcast, being, being part of a broad reach vehicle that gets into every home, uh, quote unquote free, right, if you want over the air and making it available to everyone. Um, and we are subscribing to that model. And we think that streaming and broadcast TV work hand in glove. Cable's a little bit on the, the odd man out, uh, at least with our strategy and, and what we see in the industry. If you look at our last two major rights deals, the Big Ten and NBA, they were centered around broadcast and streaming with no cable aspect. Mm. And we think that that's a differentiator for us. We have a strong streamer. We have a very strong broad reach vehicle in NBC. We, make, we market the two together to consumers and bounce audience back and forth. And we think that that's a, a winning proposition to talk to sports leagues and rights holders about. Let's talk about the NBA. Uh, we had quite a battle there. You know, for us on the media side, it was fascinating. I mean, there was news every day for a few weeks. It was, it was or great. no news every day for a few <laughs> That's weeks. Right. No news any minute. It's coming. And, um, you know, obviously we saw how, how it uh, shook out in terms of TNT not being in the mix. Uh, now, you come from Turner uh, originally years ago. Years ago. Yeah. So, you know, what did you make of TNT missing out on that? Uh, you know, that package going to Amazon and uh, it's been interesting to see the kind of war of words afterward with the NBA trying to say that I guess that package was always supposed to be streaming, and so they basically said that Turner you know, did its bid wrong, but now that the dust has settled. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on Turner's strategy. I mean, I, I think they maybe thought that there wasn't going to be as vi vibrant a market for the games as, as there turned out to be, and maybe they... They, they misjudged the timing on their discussions, but I, I won't speak to it. I wasn't in any of their rooms. Uh, we were always interested in the NBA. Uh, we, earlier in the year, expressed our interest to the league that should they get out of their exclusive window, we would love to have a conversation. When they came out of their exclusive window, we went hard and fast to have uh, conversations about executing the strategy that I kind of said. We believe in what we can do with our broadcast network, which is something that you've had some with ABC, but not major focus. And I think that we can uh, advance the, the, the dialogue around streaming. Uh, we love the sport. We love the cultural relevance of it. We love the differentiated audience. We like what it does for our prime time on NBC, and we like the, what it's going to do for us in building a uh, consistent subscriber base and heavy usage for Peacock. Yeah, you mentioned the cultural relevance, and I wanted to ask, I mean, all of these negotiations for the new NBA rights deal were happening amid the finals. I enjoyed the finals because I'm a Boston Celtics fan. I heard a lot of complaints from other people. The ratings were not great for this finals. You know, you can piece it however you want or chalk it up to, to whatever. But I think a lot gets made in the moment, and people say, oh, so did everyone overpay? Maybe the rights aren't worth, you know, this, this sky-high amount. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach it? Well, they're worth what anyone's willing to pay for it, first of all. Uh, we've been saying for 25 years or 30 years, as long as I've been kind of doing these kinds of roles, that the market's about to burst and it still hasn't burst. Hmm. Um, 
I wish it would, uh, but it hasn't. Um, the, we have a plan. We know, what, we know exactly what we paid. We know how we're going to make get that to that, and we, we have a rationale for why that makes sense for us. Uh, the amount of programming it replaces on NBC, our, our budgets for Peacock, uh, our ability to work with uh, distributors and affiliates. And so we have a plan on, on why this makes sense for us. And we look forward to getting it. We have to wait a whole year. It's, you know, the nice thing about that is un until it starts, it's the best deal we've ever done. <laughs> no one's, there's, the accountability isn't here yet. That's good. But it's, uh, you know, that's coming. And we, we are very confident that we made a good choice for our networks, for our businesses, and for our shareholders. And also, you know, there's a value in having certain sports on your network beyond just eyeballs and the ratings numbers that everyone pieces apart. So yeah, there's a circulation, there's a reach element, there's a marketing and promotion yeah. for other types of programming, whether it's programming on our networks, whether it's for our film division, whether it's for our theme park division. You know, we, we have a lot of businesses in our portfolio and having, you know, the NBA, the Olympics, the NFL, NASCAR, Premier League, Big Ten, Big Ten, golf. We are a well-rounded uh, sports portfolio, and we can serve multiple audiences to to go after to help support any of those other businesses that we have. One side effect of Turner not getting that next NBA deal, and and Mike just asked Berg Magnus about this. Got to ask you, Charles Barkley might be available and looking. Yes, he might. <laughs> um, um, we've. Uh, if Charles were available and looking, we certainly would love to have a conversation with him. We've known him for a long time. We brought him to Turner uh, when we were there in uh, 2000 or so. So we, uh, we think that Charles adds a, you know, a great element to anything he does. He's been a guest on many of our shows. He's hosted Saturday Night Live. He's, he's, he's great. And uh, you know, if he were to be available and wanted to talk to us, we'd certainly be talking to him. Got it. Heard. Um, we started by unless Burke gets there first, apparently. Well, there, I mean, there you go. Uh, we started by talking about Vanderbilt football. Let's talk about Big Ten, relatively new. You've also separately got Notre Dame on NBC, which has always had you know big enough fan base to have its own deal. Yeah. When you look at the college landscape right now, and then especially college football, and season just started three weeks ago. What do you make of the explosion? I mean, there's NIL uh, on one hand, and then it seems to me in terms of broadcast. It's really the conference realignment that is causing yeah. the greater shakeup, but they're they're related. And, and I'll add transfer portal to that. Sure. Right? I mean, any if you watch any games this weekend, you know every play-by-play -play guy says so and so transfer from. You never mm -hmm. talk about where they went to high school anymore. Mm -hmm. They're they're all transferred from, you know, Baylor or Texas or Notre Dame or somewhere. Uh, so. That's added a, a whole new element to recruiting. I mean, you have to re basically, coaches have to recruit their teams every year from start to finish. Um, the, the realignment and the shifting of schools all around the country, I think, is going to take a little while to, to shake out. Certainly, the SEC and the Big Ten have added a lot of strength and big name schools. We don't know how good they are yet, but big name schools to their, to their rosters. We're excited with the Big Ten to have Oregon and Washington and UCLA and USC as part of it. You know, this weekend we have Indiana and UCLA. They haven't played since the 1988 Rose Bowl. That, that's fun. We have Washington and Washington State, which will be exclusively on Peacock. Uh, so we have, uh, we're, we're excited by that. Notre Dame, tough weekend this weekend. Uh, tough, we'll see how that shakes out for the rest of the schedule. It's, it's a good year for uh, the new playoff system to allow them to maybe to stay alive in the hunt because that's a tough loss against a, an unranked and small school that you paid a bunch of money to come into your home opener. Uh, 1.4 million, yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we, uh, we love being part of Notre Dame. We think it has real values and something that we, we as a company, both Comcast and NBCU, think that that relationship has been important to us for three or so decades, maybe long, three and a half decades. Uh, and now the Big Ten, we, we're very excited about our partnership there, not only in football, uh, but in basketball, and both men's and women's. We had a great run last year with 
the men's basketball, but also with Caitlin Clark in Iowa yep. and, and all that. And we, we hope that that momentum will continue around uh, the college basketball world that we're now part of. We went from having no college basketball and really only having six Notre Dame football games to having over 20 college football games and a couple of hundred college basketball games. You're doing my job for me because I wanted to ask about women's sports and, and women's basketball, specifically WNBA, but you've also got you know, the NWSL. There is so much momentum right now around the women's sports leagues. And yeah. you know, we talked about the NBA deal. That also meant a new WNBA broadcast Which we're deal. part of, yep. yep. So as you look to kind of the next 10 years, what kind of um, yep. excitement do you see there, momentum, and what does it mean for you guys? We've always had a commitment to women's sports, and it'll come out in a different way, right? The Olympics are heavily, they're, they're certainly men's and women's sports. Women's teams have done exceptionally well. We've covered them extensively. We cover the trials extensively. We cover all those teams. So we've always been a believer uh, in that. We have a, uh, an Instagram thing called On Her Turf that Jenny Storms, our CMO, launched, which talks about women's sports. And uh, so we've always been a believer with the rights that we've had, which has been the Olympic rights, and then also the LPGA rights, where we have extensive coverage. Um, I think that certainly uh, the WNBA is having a, a great moment, and we hopefully that will continue to grow. We're part of it now. We're very excited about that. Uh, I think Caitlin Clark is a defining personality for college women's basketball. Again, hopefully we can all continue that. I've, I've enjoyed seeing what uh, they've done with the NWSL. We're not part of it, but uh, I've enjoyed seeing it and the, 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 the growth there. I think that you know, while it's still relatively small in the scheme of things, it, there are it, it, it is growing, and I think it's inspirational for young kids to watch. When we look at the landscape right now of the combination, you know, of streaming offerings that the big guys have, you know, in some ways NBC and, and Disney are comparable in that way. Uh, I want to ask you about what went down with Venue, which was this. Uh, three-way joint venture attempt between Fox, Disney, and Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, Fubo sought an injunction and won a temporary injunction to stop this thing from launching. But as you watch that from afar, I mean, the, the ways that that thing, if it launches, might affect you. Meanwhile, ESPN working on its own flagship streaming app of just ESPN. Yeah, it's certainly a, a muddied or complicated little situation, right? I mean, I think... Um, you know, we weren't party to that lawsuit, but I under I, I see why what the judge said. Are they first of all, why won't you offer that bundle to others? Why can't Comcast or Charter or Fubo in this case uh, buy that bundle? Um, to me, as a consumer, it's sort of it's an incomplete service in that it doesn't have all sports. It has three companies' sports, but that leaves out you know us and Paramount and Amazon who are, have major sports portfolios or growing sports portfolios and multitudes of other places that sports come in um, so that the consumer will have to decide. From our point of view, could it, the impact on us would be taking subs from you know, traditional MVPDs or VMVPDs and taking them away from our programming. Uh, that, that was the only part for us. The other part, that we worry about is, is there an informal alliance on bidding on properties, and is that legal? Hmm. As we look to the next five to 10 years with how these you know, rights deals are gonna shake out when things come up again, uh, you know, crowding into the room and, and streamers trying to get rights, in some cases, to smaller upstart leagues just to get a foothold. When you specifically look at the internet-only companies, we've mentioned Amazon in passing, there's Netflix. Uh, later in the day, we're talking to John Cruz from YouTube, and, yep. and YouTube TV is more of a platform, but in that conversation. Apple. Yeah, oh, Apple for sure, although you yep. know, I think people thought that they would uh, go for that, that big package um, in the end that YouTube, uh, the Sunday ticket that, that they didn't get in the end two years ago. Right. But um, what's your take on sort of, it's not as simple as TV, giants versus the streamers and the internet companies, but how do you look at them as they crowd into the room? They're a viable competitor, and I think we have to, we do take them as serious threats to what, if we're trying to accomplish something, I mean, they're formidable competitors who have 
money and are growing in reach. And you know, I don't think they don't have the combined reach that we would have with broadcast and streaming. Mm -hmm. And I think that that again is you know one of our advantages and our marketing machine uh, that comes with our broad portfolio of assets. Uh, but we don't look past anyone. And and if you, you know, you know. ESPN, which was the first cable sports entry, started with niche programming. I mean, you know, started with tractor pulls and softball and, you know, smaller sports until they grew and got to be more and more and earned the credibility. And, and collectively, you know, streaming has earned credibility. It's now a matter of which ones are going to be involved in the discussion and what's their plan and how can they convince the leagues and rights holders that they can help them grow their fan bases and reach big audiences. Can be very interesting to see how it all shakes out. It will be. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. We give Mark a big round of applause. Thank you. Fun. Thanks. Thanks.